Good morning. So as Matt mentioned, my name is Ankit Jain. And with me today, I have Dr. Douglas Eisenberg. He's my professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And together, we wrote a paper on a low-cost attitude determination system using multiple sensors for high-altitude balloon applications. So in the presentation today, I'll be going over a brief background. I'll be going over the actual attitude determination method proposed. I'll be talking about the experiment that we conducted and the results we gathered from it. Also, I'll be talking about future developments and briefly go over acknowledgments. So what is attitude determination? Attitude deter or what is attitude in general? Attitude is nothing but the orientation of a body. Um, there is high interest in attitude control nowadays in many dynamic systems or the pointing accuracy for a body. And these dynamic sy systems include satellites, aircrafts, and robotics. And for one to successfully control the attitude of a body successfully, they must determine the attitude of the body accurately. So that's what, what this paper proposes, uh, accurate attitude determination system for using low-cost sensors for high-altitude balloon payloads. Why high-altitude balloon payloads? There's a growing interest in high-altitude balloon payloads for scientific and um, educational experiments at high altitudes. High altitude is typically characterized between 60,000 and 120,000 feet. And they have Earth-related observations that include both geological and atmospheric. They're a great economical alternative to launch services. And an example for altitude ballooning systems in industry is Project Loon, which is developed by Google, where their purpose is to provide internet to rural, rural and remote areas. So the attitude determination system that we're proposing here is parameterized in the form of a DCM, or a direction cosine matrix. This equation here describes what a DCM basically represents. So if we have vector measurements in frame B, we can use the DCM to obtain vector measurements in an inertial frame A. The RB here represents the body frame vector measurements, and RA here represents the inertial frame vector measurements. We're using Waba's problem, um, and we're using two vector attitude determination between the sunlight and acceleration vector. To gather these two vectors, we're using solar cells and a three-axis accelerometer. And then to solve Waba's problem, we're using Markley's SVD solution. So what is Waba's problem? Grace Wildwine in 1965 formulated this problem here where the purpose is to minimize the cost function J. A and here are weights that one can use to weigh a reliable signal more versus a noisy signal we can weigh less. R A and here corresponds to, again, the inertial frame vector measurement, and R B and corresponds to the body frame and, uh, vector measurement. The conditions for Wabbage problem is that the number of independent vector measurements that we have must be equal to or greater than two. And TAB here is the orthonormal matrix or the attitude that we want to find with a determinant of plus one. So what Markley proposed is that we could rewrite uh, Wabbage problem and try to determine a matrix B that is described by the equation here. So for our specific problem, we set N is equal to two because we're using the sunlight vector and the acceleration vector. And we could rewrite that summation as the following here, where the subscript S corresponds to the sunlight vector, and the lowercase subscript A corresponds to the acceleration vector. So we could perform a singular value decomposition on this matrix B that we formed. And we obtain the orthogonal matrices U and V, and sigma here is nothing but the diagonal matrix, which has the singular values of B. So one can obtain the direction cosine matrix or your attitude from the SVD solution of the matrix B by using this relationship here where U and V again are the orthogonal matrices and sigma is the diagonal matrix where we're trying to set the diagonals to one. So to gather the inertial frame vectors itself, we, we chose to set up the inertial frame such that the gondola itself, the z-axis points upwards. That's why we experience the acceleration only in the z component for the inertial frame. And for the sunlight vector in the inertial frame, the way we gathered that was pre-flight, we gather sunlight data where to, corresponding to a point where the acceleration vector did follow this relationship where most of the acceleration was felt in the z component. So at that point, we got this sunlight vector here. So now I'm going to talk about how to gather the sunlight vector using solar cells. So a few assumptions are built in when you're using solar cells. We, we purchased um, 
flexible solar cells. And some of the assumptions involved is that the solar cell, as you can see depicted by the diagram here, is a flat device. It can only measure um, positive component of life information. It, can, it has only one sensitive side, and it can only measure the normal component of light, vector, light information because of the non-refractive uh, properties of the solar cell itself. So we assume that the parallel component is, is relatively zero, and we can only measure the perpendicular components. So the specific solar cells that we use, uh, Powerfoam Solar Inc. donated 26 of their SP337 solar cells to us. And here is an image depicting the solar cell itself. Based on analyzing the voltage versus current curves that they provided for the solar cell itself, we, we realized that to get a linear relationship between increasing light intensity and output voltage, we would like to operate the solar cell close to the short circuit current. The problem with operating the, the solar cell to short circuit current is that the voltages are very small. So we needed to amplify that voltage. So we used uh, rail to rail linear operational amplifiers and we used it in a, in an in, in a non, in, non inverting configuration. Sorry. So here the resistance 12 is to simulate a short circuit current. That's why the resistance value is so low. And here we're using the op amp in a non-inverting configuration with the gain of 39 divided by 2, I mean 39 divided by 8.2 plus 1. So how did we implement the sun sensor into our actual payload? We used a 26-sided structure that I'll talk about a little bit later when we get into the experiment section. But as you can see, each of the solar cells are relatively 45 degrees to each other. And we implemented 23 solar cells on this total. We didn't have a solar cell on the top or the bottom face. And because of a camera window, we didn't have a solar cell over here. So out of the 26 sides, we implemented 23 solar cells on this structure. So just to give a little bit of information about the way we set up the body frame and the surface frame for each of these solar cells, how do we get all these 23 solar cells into one fixed body frame of the gondola itself? The way we did this is we defined a body frame, first of all, with the x-axis pointing out towards solar panel one, and the y-axis pointing out towards solar panel three, and the z-axis pointing straight up through the box. So the bolded solar cells here in the outside represent the middle layer solar cells, so which is the straight horizontal, so, or the vertical solar cells, sorry. And then the top layer solar cells are identified by the underlined solar cells, which are like this, all the solar cells on the top layer. And then the bottom layer solar cells are the italicized ones, which are the ones on the bottom, like this. Wrong thing again, sorry. And for each of the surface frames, we define that because the solar cell only measures perpendicular component of its light information, we made each of the surface frames such that the x-axis aligns with pointing outside and away from the surface itself of the solar frame. So each of the each of these surface frames you see here are aligned such that the x-axis for each of these surfaces point outward and away from the box. So one can use rotation matrices to transform each one of these surface frames into a fixed body frame, and that is what we did. So these are rotation matrices for the x, y, and z axes, and theta is the angle between the rotation matrices, or the rotations of the frames. So here is the analysis for the middle layer, uh, middle layer itself. So we had the solar panels one, through eight that go all the way around for the middle layer, and that's what these corresponding values are here. Because we assume that it's only, um, each of the surface frames only pick up X component of light information, that's why these are one, zero, zero uh, vectors. And so to demonstrate an example, for the first solar panel, SE1, the X axis of our body is aligned with the X axis of our surface frame here itself. That's why we use the identity matrix here. But if we look at SE2, we have the z-axis pointing up, and if we use the right-hand rule, if x-axis pointing straight out towards you guys, if we rotate by pi over 4, that brings us to SC2, which is solar cell 2. And that's why each of these are just pi over 4, increments of pi over 4 as you go all the way around and come back. Same thing was done for the top layer analysis, but first we rotated again about the z-axis, and then we rotated each of those respective uh, results about their y-axis to bring it up either to the top or to the bottom solar cells. And these are the following equations corresponding to those. And here are the bottom layer equations. So after we put all those equations into one big um, system of equations, we form the, this relationship here where we have A1 through A23. And these are 
nothing but the multiplied um, result of this vector times the actual transformation matrix that we're trying to do. So that's what these resultants are over here. And RBS is what we're trying to solve to implement into Waba's problem. So one thing in Waba's problem is that all the vectors must be normalized. So once we do determine this RBS for each sample instance, we must normalize that vector before we implement into Waba's problem. This is obviously an overdetermined problem because RBS only has three components, X, Y, and Z. So we use a simple least uh, squares algorithm to solve for RBS. And a couple of things to note here is that A9 through A13 are missing in these system equations because we had wiring issues with them and they didn't perform as expected. So we eliminated them for these, from these equations. And also, if any of these AI terms here or any of these solar outputs are, have a value of zero, they must be eliminated from the system equations completely. So we apply another algorithm where if any of these values are zero, we eliminate them completely from the system of equations because otherwise we'll get erroneous results. Now I'd like to talk about how we obtain the acceleration vector using an accelerometer. So we use the low cost MEMS accelerometer and assuming a linear input output relationship, we could form this equation here where VA is the voltages that you record from the accelerometer. This is what we are interested in or this is what we want to solve for. K here, are, K and C are sensitivity and bias uh, coefficient, calibration coefficients. K here is the, includes the cost cross-coupling terms between all the different axes of, uh, axes of rotation, and C here are the bias terms for each one of the, um, for the accelerometer. The bias terms can be computed by having no acceleration in each one of the faces, so this here is actually a column vector of Cx, Cy, and Cz. One can obtain Cx by, um, by, not, by having no acceleration experienced in the x direction, that's what a bias means in that sense. So to obtain each one of the K matrix or sensitivity terms, we, form, we can form this system of equations over here, where each one of these, VAXG, VAYG, and VAZG, are nothing but voltages gathered from the accelerometer, where the x-axis faces the gravity, or 9.81 meters per second squared. That's what's going on over here. The same thing over here, YG corresponds to where the y-axis experiences 9.81 meters per second squared and same thing with the z-axis, and we could solve for um, all the sensitivity values. So once all the calibration coefficients were determined, for this specific accelerometer that we use, these are the calibration coefficients that we determined, or these are the sensitivity values we, we computed, and these are the bias values that we computed. And so all this is over here is VA, which is the voltages from the accelerometer. So to obtain your RBA vector, which we're gonna plug into Wabbage problem, Again, we need to normalize this vector before we plug it in. So to obtain this, all we do is take the voltages that we read from the accelerometer and plug it into this equation and we get our calibrated uh, acceleration vector, the body frame. So what was the actual experiment conducted? The actual experiment had a payload, as I showed earlier, of 26 sides. Um, the external skin was made from a composite sandwich between between uh, carbon, bidirectional carbon fiber layers and gnomix honeycomb in between. And we use fiberglass reinforcement for between the cracks for each one of these panels. And then we use two, two tenths of an inch styrofoam insulation on the inside to protect all the electronic components from the atmospheric environment. And we also use a 3D printed internal structure for a wireframe because as the structure is very, it has to be very uh, well geometrically developed otherwise our solar panel readings and everything are off. So just to give you a few pictures of what the payload looked like, these are the early CAD drawings of where we started. We, have, we also printed all our internal mounting brackets for all our different sensors and everything like that using 3D printer as well or rapid prototyping. This image right here is the structure straight out of the 3D printer. This is fresh out of the 3D printer and over here is just another depiction of a few of the mounting switches and everything like that. We, produced using the 3D printer as well. The image over here depicts the carbon fiber structure or composite structure with the Nomex honeycomb in between, and you could also see the blue two-tenths of an inch styrofoam insulation in all the panels. Over here, you can see the yellow stuff. That, those are actually micro balloons or the fiber glass reinforcements that we use between each one of the cracks so we have a uh, well, I guess a smooth structure. Here's some more pictures. This, is, this picture and this picture are the, some of the final results. This is right on the day before we flew it with 
it looks like a pretty big mess with all those wiring and stuff, but it worked okay. <laughs> but this is right before we flew it, and this is the assembly process right here, basically in a CAD drawing of how this uh, structure comes together. So now I'd like to show you a uh, video, a small clip of the actual flight that we had. And as you can see, our payload is the only one with booms right there. So you can see the little styrofoam balls on the side. But the reason we use those booms were so we could try to stabilize the rotation of the gondola itself. So we don't spin too much or out of control. So a few of the flight details. This flight was, con this flight was conducted for the ANSWER um, Arizona Space, Space Grand Ascent uh, project. And this flight was on March 29, 2014, and the burst altitude was recorded at approximately 73,794 feet. Now I'd like to talk about the results that we gathered from the experiment. So there is no reference attitude that we can compare our results against. So we had to figure out another way to test our accuracy of our system or our attitude estimation algorithm itself. So what we did was we obtained angular velocity information from the estimated attitude that we computed for each, temp or for each sample instance, and we compared it against the angular velocity information that we gathered using a rate gyroscope. So now I'm going to go through on how to gather angular velocity from the rate gyroscope. It's the calibration process is very similar to the one that I mentioned for the accelerometer. We again use the low-cost MEMS ray gyroscope, and if we assume a linear input-output relationship, again we can form some uh, relationship like this, where S is nothing but the ma a three-by-three three matrix of sensitivity values, including all the co cross-coupling terms, and B is nothing but the column vector of bias terms. So again, we could form a system of equations like this, but instead of experiencing 9.81 meters per second squared, we actually rotated our gondola about the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, and this what these values are. And we use a turntable to estimate the rotation, and that's what we use for the calibration over here to determine all our sensitivity terms. After we determined these coefficients, we plugged it into the equation. So these are the sensitivity values that we computed for the specific uh, ray gyroscope, and these are the bias terms that we computed for the specific ray gyroscope. Again, these are the voltages that are measured from the ray gyroscope, and we could use this equation to obtain the angular velocity in the body frame for this specific application over here. So how do we get our angular velocity information from the estimated attitude? Well, through a little bit of manipulation of math and starting off before, you end up in this equation right here, where the differentiated form of your estimated attitude is equal to the attitude itself times the skew symmetric matrix where you can extract your x, y, and z components. So x, y, and z components of your angular velocity in the body frame. So to differentiate the DCM, what we did was we used a central difference method. And because differentiation introduces noise and phase shifts, we had to use an ideal low pass filter to make our data a little bit more reliable. Or to make sense of it, I guess. So we used a Fourier transform of the original signal. So for each component of the omega x, omega y, omega z, we took a Fourier transform of that. And then we determined our break frequencies using the Fourier transform. And these are the actual break frequencies that we used for each one of the components that we determined. And, to get it, and then we formed an ideal low pass filter by just making a square wave with each one of these break frequencies. And we multiplied it by the Fourier transform of the signal itself. And to get it back in the time domain, we took an inverse Fourier transform of the result. So these are the results that we got. And as you can see here, this is the angular velocity in the x, y, and z components. The blue line here represents the angular velocity that we gathered from the ray gyroscope. And the red line here represents the angular velocity that we obtained from the DCM or the estimated attitude. So as you can see here, from here to until, so let me get over the timing diagrams real quick. So at time is equal to zero, it's basically the data logger started. Over here, this little bump represents the launch of the balloon itself. Over here, we see the burst. And then over here, we see the ground impact. So until burst, it looks pretty OK. Things make sense and everything like that. But after burst, the thing is that it, the ray gyroscope measures a lot of collisional information because of the nature of the ray gyroscope itself or the type of sensor it is. So it provides a lot of erroneous data because you're not actually measuring only angular velocity, but you're measuring, you're measuring collisional information. 
And that's what makes this data erroneous after the burst. And that's why you can see the, the, the sensor itself kind of went at a fault. It didn't know what to do with it. So if we zoom in a little bit close, if we zoom in in one of the, uh, one of the time steps at in the ascent profile where it did kind of look okay, the X and Y um, axes experience noise basically. The, yeah, they don't really much, they don't show much signal. But if we look at the Z axis, we actually get a little bit of rotation. That's what we expect. Most of, our, most of our rotation is about the z-axis for the gondola during a balloon flight. So as you can see here, we experience z-axis rotation. And again, the blue line is the angular velocity from the ray gyroscope, and the red line is the angular velocity from the DCM. And it actually gave me chills once we looked at this graph. And I'm like, these are completely three different independent systems, because the ray gyroscope is an independent sensor, the accelerometer is an independent sensor, and the sunlight or the solar shells are independent sensors too. And them matching up that close to each other, especially the trends and the peaks, it was pretty like, oh, this actually turned out pretty well. It's pretty accurate in that sense. So future developments that we can do with the system are that we would like to use more than two independent vector measurements in Wabash Prom, because the more independent vector measurements you use, the more accurate your attitude gets. We would like to use a two-vector, again, two-vector attitude determination between the magnetic field vector and sunlight vector instead of acceleration vector, because again, acceleration or an accelerometer is a sensor that picks up collisional information, and that could again introduce erroneous data into your attitude determination itself. And then we would like to have some kind of reference um, attitude to compare our attitude that we computed against, because differentiating the attitude and forming or obtaining the angular velocity introduces phase shifts, like I mentioned earlier, and a lot of noise. So one possibility is obtaining roll pitch and yaw information using image and video processing, and we're kind of looking at that, but we didn't get much far in that so far. So to a few people I would like to acknowledge are the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Prescott, uh, the College of Engineering, and the Arizona Space Grant Consortium for funding this project. I'd like to thank Jack Crabtree and the Answer Group for providing the flight, the balloon, and everything like that. I'd like to thank Powerfilm Solar Inc. for donating their 26 of their solar panels for our research. And I would like to also thank my 2004 Spring Ascend Pale of Bill team, um, which have the following names. And now I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Go ahead. Um, two questions. One is, when you were showing the original structure, you said that there was a place for a camera. Yes, sir. Was there a camera on board? Yes, sir. You did not compare your attitudes to what the camera was showing? The camera didn't perform as we expected because the battery life wasn't suitable, I guess. We got too cheap of a camera. So next time, we need to get a better camera, I guess, a better video recorder, so we could actually have good video evidence. And what did this cost? This whole project cost, I had a budget of $300 when I started, and we were under budget for $300. So all the solar panels, well, the solar panels were donated. The solar panels were donated, yes. But each of the solar panels cost about 3 to $4 if you buy in bulk from Powerform Solar for the exact model that we use. So you're looking at roughly around, uh, roughly around $90 for the 26 solar panels if you were to get 26 solar panels. Or, yeah. Was the Nomex core composite sheet, uh, did you order that as a sheet, or did you actually create those uh, composite? We actually have machinists in, in our school that gather carbon fiber, bidirectional carbon fiber. We wet lay them ourselves sometimes, and sometimes our machinists do it for us. Sure. So the Nomex honeycomb is just a product, I guess, we had in the machine shop, and we right. just used that. Have right, you created that? Uh, the composite, yeah, the sandwich. The Nomex composite yourself? Yep. Quick question I'll ask. Um, although I was, I was happy to see you using solar panels from a company that's literally in my backyard, <laughs> um, the, uh, was there a specific reason for using solar panels instead of using like you know a, a, another type of light sensor? Well, we for we actually have an experimental space system lab class for our courses aerospace engineering, and in that class we actually used the solar cells that I showed here. 
and we had experience with those solar cells already. So that's the reason we actually kind of pushed forward with those solar cells for this research, because we knew it worked in the kind of characteristics we wanted. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So I was just curious, uh, did you do this as part of a, of a, a class, a re uh, independent research? This research was specifically for the NASA Space Grant Ascent Project. So it was a Arizona Space Grant Consortium uh, project that they have, which is called Ascent Project. If I go back one slide, yeah, where'd it go? Yeah, so we actually had a payload build team for the NASA Space Grant Ascent Project itself, and we went to Phoenix down to UFA and flew that structure. And uh, there were lots of experiments on that balloon launch that you showed. Those were all part of that same project? Not, well, yeah, they were all part of the same project, but so they're all different schools. So like UFA, ASU, and then a bunch of community colleges came down, and we all flew together. It was part of the NASA Space Grant Consortium. Yep. So they asked you to write a proposal uh, for your project, and then they selected? No, well, basically, it's every school has funding for these type of projects. And like you have different projects, like in, internal projects itself for each of the NASA Space Grant. I guess, funding projects. So Ascend was just one of those that our school chose to opt in. So I just came in and said that, hey, I want to do this research. And they gave me the chance. And I'm like, OK. One more question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I am just, can you say a little bit about, um, so I'm not an engineer. So I'm just curious like, why you would want to know. The attitude of the body? Yeah, yeah. Can you say like, what the application? Well, there is many applications. Let's say the presentation that we had previously where it was constrained, the, the gondola or the booms itself were constrained to the balloon itself. But if you had some kind of attitude control system, you wouldn't need to constrain that. And you could have multiple payloads, and you can point the accuracy or point the, the body itself to a certain direction. And there are many other applications. Like if we're in orbit in, in, uh, around the Earth, let's say for a satellite, and you're using solar panels as one of your power generation methods, then you would want to point your solar panels to the sun as many times as possible. And this project, again, the attitude estimation system that we're trying to propose here is a stepping stone for the EagleSat project that we have, the QSAT project, um, that we're trying to launch with the Cal Poly um, oh. rockets. Yeah. So this is like a stepping stone for their project. So they're trying to use our attitude estimation system in that sense. If Gordon McIntosh was here, he'd say, I need that because for his cosmic ray project, mm -hmm. he wanted to know which direction his cosmic ray sensor is, is pointing. Yep. There is a lot of applications nowadays for where you want, want to point your gondola or body in a certain way. And this is not, it, again, this attitude estimation algorithm just doesn't apply to only high altitude balloons. It could be used in orbits. It can be used in other applications. Quick question. What was your final uh, payload weight? I missed that. Oh, it was uh, three pounds and one ounce, I believe. Like, right, just a little bit over three pounds. Our limit was three pounds. Okay. 